doing this right now. We are continuing our journey through the book of Acts. We're a third of the way through. So this morning is day 11. That means it's Acts chapter 11. And just again, an encouragement to you. Um, if you want to be following along on the Dwell app, it's the Dwell audio app we've made available to you as a church family free of charge. This is, you can go to fouroakskalarn.com and sign up for it there. Download it on your, on your device. And there's a little Bible reading plan called, here we go, Follow the Early Church. And you can read through a chapter of day of the book of Acts. You can use this thing to exercise when you're walking around the house, going to sleep at night. Um, just an awesome way to absorb the word of God into your soul in terms of whatever you're doing. So let me pray for us and we're going to dive in this morning. I'm excited about this one. For Oaks. It's, a, it's a great, it's a great chapter, as all the chapters in the Bible are, but you get what I'm saying. Lord, go before us right now and nourish our souls in the pure milk of the Word of God. Lord, we are babies. We are helpless. We need um, the milk of your living Word to nourish our souls and to grow us. So, Lord, would you do that for us today? Would you uh, bless our time, these minutes we have here together, in Jesus' name, amen. So, the last we left off in this riveting book of Acts was in Acts chapter 10, when Peter was given this vision of clean and unclean animals. God says, Peter, the clean and the unclean are good for you. They're fine. And this was a object lesson for Peter to realize that the gospel, the gift of salvation, was not just to be confined to the ethnic Jewish population or converts to Judaism. In fact, it was to be made available to everyone, every tongue, tribe, and nation, all the Gentiles. And this man, Cornelius, was centurion. He was a God-fearer, but he was a Greek. And it was here that Peter saw the salvation of the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit descend upon Cornelius and his family. And so here we are now up to Acts 11, and what Luke is wanting to give us is a, is a snapshot, a picture of what happens next. Now, one of the things that happens is that this results in the founding of the church in Antioch. And, and this was a church that was going to be full of both Jew, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And as we're going to see... Um, almost for the rest of the book of Acts, it is the story of Antioch, which now becomes the great epicenter of the explosion of the early church all across the ancient world and the Roman Empire into every nook and cranny and corner as Gentile believers are saved in mass. And that's, that's really going to be uh, most of the rest of the book of Acts. And it's Antioch that launches out Paul and Barnabas on these missionary journeys. But today, what we want to look at is the section at the beginning of Acts 11, which talks about the response of the Jewish church in Jerusalem to the inclusion of the Gentiles. And, and their response to it might take us by surprise. It's almost like a, a minor note in a major key that's being played out here. And so let's look together, if you have your Bibles, Acts 11 beginning in verse 1. Let's read the first three verses. It says, Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, uh, stop, stop here, threw a party for them, right? No, no, no. The circumcision party criticized him, meaning Peter saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Now, on one hand, it would be very easy to disparage these groups who Luke calls the circumcision party. Um, remember, these were Jewish Christians who had very strong convictions about following Old Testament um, civil and ceremonial and, and different aspects of the Old Testament law. And it would be very easy, would it not, to disparage them. Oh, these are just theological nitpickers. These are 
the legalists of the early church. They're the fundamentalists. They're the, the party poopers. Um, we invited them to, to, to squelch all the fun here, and, and they can't take great joy in this, and they're these sectarian, mean folks. And, and there's elements of all that in there, but let, let's not disparage too much. Let's, let's try to put ourselves into their shoes. These were faithful Christians. These were Christians who had been under immense persecution. Um, they um, had converted to Christianity and followed Jesus as the Messiah, most likely at great incredible cost to themselves and to their families and their livelihoods. They just had particularly strong moral convictions um, about associating um, or violating Old Testament laws. For them, um, it was a violation of their conscience. It was, it was something that burdened their souls. For them, it was sin. And, the, and one of the things I think we, we want to do here is realize that as believers now in the 21st century, we're much more in the place of the circumcision party than we are of the Gentiles who are out in the world and unsaved. Many of us have been Christians for many years, decades. Uh, maybe we've been reared in a Christian family, but we're certainly now part of a Bible-believing church, and we're growing in our faith. The, the, the odds are, if you're tuning in this morning um, to this devotional, it's because you are probably a mature Christian or one who wants to grow and to become a mature Christian, and and. So along the way in your life, you have come to hold certain convictions about things, maybe very strong convictions, maybe based upon your background or your understanding of scripture or your family or, your, or where you're from, you might have very strong convictions about alcohol, that um, it's, it's, it's just, it, it violates your conscience to think about partaking in alcohol. Some of you might, us, I'll say us, might have really strong convictions about food, right? That there is a pure way to eat or a true way to eat or a more godly way to eat. Maybe you have strong convictions about schooling, that, you, that your kids don't need to be in a public school, or maybe you believe your kids do need to be in a public school or homeschool or private school. Maybe you have strong convictions about politics, lines in the sand that you would, it feels like, die for. Maybe you have strong convictions about movies and media and what we should and should not be viewing. Maybe you have strong convictions about whether women should work outside the home on a full-time basis if they have little kids. Maybe right now you have very strong convictions about pandemics and how we should or should not be walking through them. I say all these things as examples to say all of us have these things. All of us have these strong convictions about how we're living and working out the, the principles of God's word in our lives. And here's what's important. Peter doesn't try to convince them otherwise. He doesn't tell them that they're immature. He doesn't tell them that, that their minds are not being shaped by the word of God. He doesn't tell them that these are all areas that we have freedom in Christ, even though I think as we're going to see, all of that is true. Because Peter recognizes, as Luther recognizes, as we need to recognize, that, that the Lord is Lord of the conscience. And all of us have to live and stand before the Lord in the choices that we make and the convictions that we have around a variety of issues. So that's not the problem. The problem is not that this group of Christians still follows the Old Testament um, law as it relates to circumcision. Okay. The problem is that they have made it a barrier to gospel fellowship. They have, they have made it a means of including and excluding people from the family of God based upon these, um, not that they're unimportant, but secondary convictions. And that's a big problem. And this is what we would call the gospel plus. In other words, the gospel saves us. The gospel justifies us, but we know, right? We know, quote unquote, that there's there's Christians, and then there's like spiritually mature Christians. Um, there's there there's there's immature Christians that that 
don't know they're right from the left, but, but we who are mature, who have strong convictions about these other issues, we really know best. And although we don't say it this way, the people over here are more second class. And all of us struggle in various ways in this. Now, we're often blinded to it. It's very easy to, to see it with circumcision, something that doesn't have any relevance for us in terms of religious uh, practice and law today. But those other things that I just mentioned, boy, I guarantee you, as I was narrating those and listing those out, you immediately came to mind, yes, Pastor Will, I do have some strong convictions about things. And what we want to say, first of all, is that's okay, that's good. We need to have strong convictions about things. However, we need to be very careful that we don't exclude people based on anything outside of the gospel. And here is where Peter brings an important peace to bear for us and how we're to discern these things. Look in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 11. And this is what Peter says. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way. So what do we see Peter doing? Peter's saying, let me tell you how we adjudicate what is right and wrong and secondary and not secondary here. Let's go back to the word of God. And here he is recalling undoubtedly what Jesus said in Acts 1, what Jesus said in, and John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter 3. And of course, Peter was witnesses to both of these things. And he is remembering, ah, Yes, here's, here's what we need to bring to bear to, to resolve this issue of whether Gentiles can come into the church or not and whether they have to be circumcised or not. He said, here's the test. What does the word of God say? And so there's several lessons, and I just want to list them out in no particular order that I think we can take from a text like this. Number one, we always have to be super clear that the word of God is our ultimate standard. The word of God is our ultimate authority. That, that while opinions and convictions are important, they always have to be subservient to what the Word of God says. Number one. Number two, we can all have convictions. We should all have convictions um, about a variety of issues that the Scriptures might be, uh, they might speak to in principle, but they don't speak to necessarily in terms of practice. And that could be all the way from things we eat to things we watch to how we conduct our Sabbath day to how we do family worship. There could be a, how we school our kids. There could be a whole host of things that fall into this category, and that's okay. Number three, though, we want to make sure that we are not more evangelistic and proselytizing about our convictions than we are about the actual gospel. And so a lot of times um, things uh, it can come across from people in the Christian community that, that yeah, I, we're all Christians of the gospel, but if you do X, Y, and Z, your life will be better. If you do X, Y, and Z, then, 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 then you've obtained a level of spiritual maturity. And again, we want to be careful we're not more evangelistic about our thing than we are about the gospel. Number four, where the scriptures are clear we absolutely positively must stand firm, and this is what we see Peter doing here. He doesn't for a minute capitulate to the circumcision party. He doesn't for a minute say, well, you know, you guys are right. Let me go back and talk to the Gentiles and, and see if they'd be willing to consider this circumcision thing and blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. Um, he takes his stand on the clear convictions of the word. Now, number five, you may say, Pastor Paul, but what if we have... What if Christians have different convictions about what we think the Word of God speaks to clearly versus what it doesn't speak to clearly? And, and, and that's, a, that's an important issue. So, so, for example, I believe the Scripture speaks very clearly, and I'm speaking now as a pastor, as a person, um, about the electing grace, the sovereign electing grace of God. I think it is super clear all the way from Ephesians 1 to Genesis 12 to Paul's conversion in Acts 9 that salvation is from the Lord and that we have come to faith in him because he has first chosen us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I think it's, 
Um, and we could talk about this um, in a separate time, and there'll be time in Acts to talk about this. And but, but let's say you or someone else has a different conviction about that. Well, this is why we have statements of faith. This is why we have local churches to say, you know what? We are coming together and fellowshipping around the gospel based upon what we believe are the clear convictions of Scripture. And that's why we have local churches. That's why we have statements of faith. It doesn't mean that if we're part of this local church that we disparage the universal church because it might have different convictions about things. I know we still have fellowship in the gospel, but in terms of teaching, submission, authority, that happens at the local level under a statement of faith. Last thing I want to say about this is this is a great call, is it not, to be a firsthand believer or firsthand reader of the Bible. In other words, don't delegate your Bible knowledge to someone else. Don't, don't, um, don't delegate it to me. Don't delegate it to another leader or a more mature Christian. And by delegate, I don't mean don't, you're not to learn from them and lean upon them and hear their teaching and hear their counsel. That's not what I'm saying. Of course, we all do that. What I mean is don't have a mediated knowledge of the Bible through someone else. Read the word of God for yourself. Test the spirits, test the prophecies, be like the Bereans. They were, they were parceling through the teaching of the apostles, un, trying to understand from the word of God what was being said and taught. And so, um, yes, we all need teachers. Yes, we all need um, people to pour and speak and teach into and preach into our lives. But let that not be a mediated knowledge where we don't know our right from our left theologically. Let's be students of the word so that just like Peter, when the moment arises, we can say, ah, I remember the words of the Lord about this. And here's what God said about this particular thing. All right, Four Oaks, use this season. Don't waste this season. Make it one where you grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus through his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, this is, Acts 11 is a good word for us, Lord. We all take our stand, or tempted to take our stand upon things that um, may not be super clear to everyone in the same way. Lord, let us be careful to walk in your grace, to not exclude from fellowship or from our orbs and spheres of friendship those who might have different convictions. Let our stand be upon the gospel. Let that be the dividing line in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, folks, go enjoy this wonderful, beautiful day. It's been great being with you. See you here, same time.